Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Clark, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Buffalo. I also serve as the chair to the Erie County Community Climate Change Task Force. So the purpose of this video is to provide a relatively short summary of how to talk about climate change. First, we'll start off with some information about why it is important to talk about this issue. Next, I'll summarize some information about why it tends to be so difficult to talk about climate change. I'll then summarize some tips and best practices that I'm hoping will help you become more effective at communicating about climate change. I'll also provide you with some brief but locally relevant climate change information that might be helpful for you to talk about the way in which climate change is specifically predicted to impact us in Western New York. And finally, I have a slide with some resources that might be useful for you if you want to find out more. So let's get started. So social scientists, policymakers, businesses, and non-governmental organizations are grappling with this question of how to increase citizen engagement in climate change issues. This is really important because certain lifestyle choices or specific behaviors remain carbon intensive and unsustainable, and therefore must be altered if we are going to successfully address climate change. Individual engagement in climate change issues can motivate some of these necessary behavior changes as well as foster the acceptance and longevity of climate-friendly policies. There's also an inherent difficulty in communicating the urgency of climate change. Some good news is that about 80% of Americans say that they actually believe in climate change and that it's happening. However, most don't consider it a key issue to address. In fact, a recent poll found that most Americans do not list climate change in their top concerns for our nation. So talking about climate change, in particular impacts we are already seeing, and could see in the near future may be useful to change this mindset. Paying to mitigate climate change and its impacts are often perceived as an economic burden, especially in times when there's already financial strain, prioritizing climate change might seem a bit unwarranted or at least not a priority. However, studies show that waiting to act on reducing emissions and adapting to existing climatic changes will result in even greater economic burdens in the future. Thus, talking about this issue and taking action to mitigate and address it now is really important. And this will save us economically over the long term, as well as, you know, prevent other negative consequences. So finally, with time, everyone will personally feel the effects of climate change if you have not, you know, felt those effects already. So if we don't, do not act now, more and more people's livelihoods and well-being will diminish. So why not do what we can to bring this issue to the forefront of our conversations, which will increase the likelihood of meaningful engagement and action. Although it is important to talk about this issue, as most of us are painfully aware, it is often not an easy task to do so. I'm gonna go over some factors why this is the case. Contributing to this communication difficulty is the fact that climate change is perceived to be uncertain. Although this is partially true, the climate models and information that we do have about the potential impacts of climate change are much more advanced than they have really ever been. What is most uncertain are the human dimensions of the issue. Who knows if we'll reduce our emissions relatively quickly in the near future, or, you know, and which would result in reducing some of the most severe implications. Or will we continue along more like a business as usual pathway resulting in significantly more emissions and more severe impacts. So which future that lies ahead of us is really unknown, and therefore the actual severity of impacts we will experience is also difficult to say for certain. So it's not that we're uncertain that climate change will cause impacts, it's really about the severity of those impacts depending on which pathway we choose to follow in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we're able to mitigate. Over, over the next few um, decades. Also engaging the public in climate change issues is a particularly challenging endeavor because the impacts are often perceived to be in the distant future and or not personally relevant. Climate change often lacks the day-to-day -day relevance necessary to motivate behavior changes and much of the public has not perceived climate change to be particularly vivid, relevant, or alarming. Another problem is that our attentional resources are limited. And so individuals are not always able to notice or further process all this information that we have about our environment, which is a, which is a lot of information. 
And even with when climate change is noticed and accepted as relevant, it must compete with other issues for priority. For instance, studies show that the public views health, family, safety, finances, and terrorism to be of greater concern than climate change. Because competing issues reduce the importance attached to climate change, engaging citizens in climate change issues remains difficult. Part of the problem can also be attributed to perceptions of psychological distance or the degree to which objects, people, places, and events are removed from an individual's immediate direct experience. This includes impacts that might be experienced in places far away, say small island states dealing with sea level rise, or effects felt far off in the future and impacting future generations. It is well known that people have a tough time dealing with risks that have time lags of decades or even centuries. Therefore, increasing awareness of climate change is not sufficient for engagement because it's often perceived as a distant threat. And lastly, there's an ongoing debate over the effectiveness of emotional climate change appeals. Usually, they tend to be doom and gloom type messaging used to convey the problem in a way that catches people's attention and is geared to generate their emotions. Some scientists argue against this approach because it can depress and demoralize the public into further inaction. At the same time, others praise this type of messaging because they see it as an honest portrayal of the challenges we may face. So, you know, if the science on this is, is inconsistent, inconsistent, how are we supposed to move forward effectively? In sum, individuals readily distance climate change from their personal lives which suggests that effective communication strategies should aim to reduce the gap between climate impacts and personal concerns. And you'll see that as a major theme in the tips and strategies that I'll present here in just a second. Okay, so we're moving on to some strategies to help make talking about climate change easier and more effective. So this slide particularly summarizes tips offered by Jane Burston, who is an executive director of the Clean Air Fund. And um, you know, she provides us her top five tips for talking about climate change based on her long career in climate change, science, and policy. So first and foremost, Jane says, you, your primary task is not to tell people climate change is happening or to make them worry about it. Most people already actually know this, and many are actually pretty concerned about it. Despite what some media outlets and politicians would have you believe, public awareness of and concern about climate change is consistently high. In fact, two thirds of the US public worry about climate change a great deal or a fair amount, as they have done now for two decades. The challenge then isn't awareness, it's action. Concerns exist, but do not influence day-to-day -day decisions. People tend not to think about climate change when deciding, for example, how to travel, how to invest their money, or which energy supplier to use. Getting people to be more aware of how their personal actions contribute to the problem will likely be more effective than talking more abstractly about the issue um, or just sort of more generally about the problem. And showing them, you know, a complicated scientific chart is not going to help the situation either. Number two, so creating urgency is the real challenge. When trying to convey, convey the urgency of mitigating climate change, it is tempting to focus on the dreadful impacts we are likely to see if we carry on emitting at current levels, because these sound really big and really dramatic. But big and dramatic is often unhelpful. It can make the scale seem beyond what anyone can influence. Talking about things in the far off future can seem so distant that it makes the whole thing unreal. So instead, Jane says, talk about what we are already experiencing. For example, 17 of the 18 hottest years ever recorded have happened in this century. Arctic summer sea ice is declining rapidly at a rate of 13% per decade since the 1970s. Extreme weather events such as heat waves, droughts, and heavy rainfall are increasing in frequency during, during, uh, sorry, due to climate change. These events lead to loss of lives and livelihoods and social and political turmoil. These facts are real, they're present, and they're immediate. That's how you help to create urgency. Number three, make projections personal. So Jane says there are times when it's worth discussing projections, which are the anticipated future impacts of climate change, particularly for people in areas that haven't yet been affected as much because everyone at some point will be impacted. If you do go into projections, get personal. 
Climate projections are typically communicated in terms of averages, especially headline statements about increases in global temperatures. This masks or hides a huge amount of global variability and impacts. If you're to motivate people to act, getting beyond this and into the specifics of what they will experience is key. For example, if we carry on emitting as we are now in Florida, sea level rise will continue, meaning high tides will flood further inland every decade, leaving houses uninsurable and potentially unsellable. In Europe, heat waves of the kind that occurred in 2003, killing more than 50,000 people will become increasingly likely. In sub-Saharan Africa, a much higher risk of droughts could lead to insufficient access to drinking and irrigation water and reduced agricultural productivity. So these are things that you know, are specific to um, particular places. Four, Jane says to name drop and to acknowledge sort of these these folks that people might listen to or acknowledge um, on the issue of climate change. So in all communications, the messenger is as important as the message. So that principle extends to what you say as well, because referring to others, particularly when they are surprising, is a powerful trigger. Messengers that Jane in particular suggests referring to are the world's biggest oil and gas companies, which are acknowledging the reality of human-induced climate change at this point. Investors who are asking the CEOs of companies to consider the impact of their operations on climate change in the environment. Experts and decision makers across the world who say climate change is the biggest risk facing them and now have done so for many years. You could also reference insurance companies who now assess risk um, and climate change as a part of that as part of their business strategy. Depending on the person or group that you are speaking with, Bringing up these types of people who are talking climate change seriously may be an effective strategy. The last one, which is really important, give people meaningful agency. So the last tip from Jane is to make sure that when you communicate about climate change, you give people ideas for what they can meaningfully do. The important word here is meaningfully. Too many campaigns oversell insignificant actions like recycling or things like conserving water when possible. Of course, these things make a difference, but only a, a small fractional one. This approach risks either diminishing the issue. For example, someone might think if turning off lights or reducing the amount of water I, I use can solve the problem, then it can't be really all that serious. Or it could diminish the individual. If that's all I can do, I'm just not gonna do anything. The most significant elements of most people's carbon footprint are travel and home energy use. So tackle the difficult stuff and talk about them, talk to the people about this, but also recognize that they're part of a collective in their community or workplace. So if they can do things at sort of that broader scale or contribute to collective actions that reduce their carbon footprint, then those things will likely be more effective. Okay, so building on those tips, I found a particularly useful published paper that discusses strategies related to the science of communicating climate change. So here are the key results, and I'll bring them up one at a time here. So first, messages about climate change should illustrate the local and regional impacts of climate change, because these may be more captivating than global impacts, and yet citizens do not often include them in their mental representations of climate change. Number two, to reduce temporal distance from the issue, Climate change should be framed as an immediate current problem rather than a remote threat. That's the urgency part we've already talked about. Third, because citizens rarely connect climate change to health threats or extreme weather, messages that incorporate these elements may increase concern. Fourth, existing uncertainties should be acknowledged so that the audience retains trust in the speaker. For example, as already discussed, there are uncertainties in the future impacts of climate change since we do not know which emission pathway, uh, you know, say turning to renewables or business as usual lies ahead. The fifth strategy is to target messages to specific groups and address the particular barriers to climate action that they particularly may face. For example, the barriers to climate action likely differ across a variety of demographics. For instance, things like race and age. Taking a more personal approach will likely be more useful. And along the same lines, it is important to listen to the person or people you are speaking with to understand what they value and what they care about. That way your message can be more tailored to be relevant to their concerns and situations. 
As an example, you could say something like, if you're a subsistence or industrial fisherman in a coral reef environment, and we're 90% certain those coral reefs are going to be destroyed in the next 50 years, the death or harm of the reef becomes very immediate and profound to your family and your community. This type of message will be more powerful to certain groups than others, and often you gain some credibility as a messenger just by listening to what people actually care about. And lastly, sometimes a really good visual can be a powerful tool to help you communicate about complicated issues like climate change. Here I have a couple of resources that you might want to check out. Um, for example, the figure on the right is a picture provided by the second link, climatevisuals.org, that offer many photos, often telling personal and human stories related to the causes and impacts of climate change, which are known to be more powerful and encourage action. The other link has some animations that help us to visualize climate trends in useful ways. For example, the climate spiral, which shows in a 3D spiral visualization form the increase in global temperatures observed over time since 1850. These simple to understand and I think appealing visuals might be useful to help communicate the problem to a variety of audiences. All right, so we're getting to the last part of the presentation. Um, you may be recognizing a theme in the tips and strategies that I just discussed. In order to communicate effectively about climate change, it is recommended to make it locally relevant, personal, as well as urgent. One way to do that is to talk about the impacts already being experienced in the region, as well as predicted changes in the near future that people care about. Talking about the implications to human health and for extreme weather events are also known to be particularly effective. The next few slides are meant to provide a summary of locally relevant climate information that you could use to help communicate about this issue, particularly for Western New York. The first slide is about increases in average temperatures. The IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is just a group of hundreds of scientists that regularly assess the scientific basics of climate change to the United Nations, they predict that Buffalo's average temperature will be similar to the temperatures currently experienced in Louisville, Kentucky, which is 500 miles to our southwest. This notion of a shifting climate is also shown in the figure I have here on the right hand side of the slide, where depending on the emission scenario again, the climate of New York will migrate, becoming like the climates currently experienced by states further south. So the red in the figure is sort of the higher emission scenarios with more significant climate impacts, where the yellow colors, um, the, the shift is much less because those are for lower emission scenarios. So if we you know, turn to renewable energy and reduce or mitigate our impacts very quickly, the impacts would be less severe. So this shift is particularly problematic for Buffalo because it has a variety of old housing stock, which means that many older buildings and homes are just not insulated or weatherized well. So as temperatures warm, as the climate change, people living in older homes that are not well insulated, which may be some of our most vulnerable populations in the region, Will be more exposed to these weather extremes. Along similar lines is the problem of extreme heat for western New York. It is typical for Buffalo to experience heat, heat waves during the summer months currently. However, these heat waves are expected to occur more frequently and the temperatures associated with these heat waves are likely to get even hotter. Buffalo has actually never experienced a day over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, at least not yet. However, again, depending on the emission scenarios of our future, we could see in a range from three to 14 days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of this century. That's a huge change, especially with higher emission scenarios resulting in something like 14 more days each summer we experience over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So why is this important? Well, more exposure to heat has significant impacts on our health. Remember, referring to human health issues and impacts helps increase the effectiveness of talking about climate change. So um, according to the National Weather Service, heat is the number one weather related killer in the United States. So as shown in this infographic, rising temperatures and more frequent heat waves mean more deaths caused by excessive heat. And these are related to problems of dehydration, heat stroke, aggregated, aggravated cardiovascular and respiratory illnesses. And unfortunately, the youth, elderly, and the poor are the groups that tend to be more vulnerable to these heat-related illnesses. So our most vulnerable people in our population will be impacted more by this increase in, in heat waves that we are likely to 
experience at some level here in Western New York over the next few decades. Another important impact to our region is, in, is changes in lake ice and lake effect snow. As air temperatures and water temperatures rise, there will be less ice cover on the Great Lakes. Although this may not seem too problematic to most of us, it does have implications for lake effect snow. In fact, with less ice cover, the likelihood of extreme lake effect snowstorms increases. As cold air gets pushed across the warmer water, it can generate large amounts of snow for our region. And anyone residing in our area back in 2014 remembers this November lake effect storm that I have shown here in the, in the picture on the right that crippled much of our region for quite some time. So these types of events could become more likely in our region. The last impact I will cover is in this presentation is extreme precipitation and flooding. The key issue here is that precipitation patterns are changing and will continue to change in New York State due to climate change. Not only has the annual amount of precipitation changed, the frequency and intensity of extreme precipitation events has also changed. For example, the number of rainfall events that produce precipitation in excess of one inch have increased over the past 50 years, and the events that produce more than two inches of precipitation have had the highest frequency in the past 10 years. This is expected to increase further over the next several decades. Also of importance is that with increasing temperatures, we will likely see less snow and more rain associated in winter storms. This could mean significant impacts on winter tourism and recreational activities in the region, as well as many ecological impacts like more pests entering the area, just to name some implications of this, both temperature and precipitation change that we will be seeing. More flooding and associated erosion and just changing precipitation patterns in general also could mean negative impacts for the local agriculture sector as well. Okay, so we've reached the last slide. The last thing I wanted to do in this presentation is to provide some additional information on this important topic. So the first link I actually already mentioned, um, it allows the use of compelling photographs to help communicate the causes and impacts in a really powerful and effective manner. The second is another resource to visualize climate change impacts for cities across the globe. So check that out. The third one is a short but informative resource offered by the Nature Conservancy about the impacts of climate change in New York State. The fourth link um, you could use to find out information related to Erie County climate change, and in particular, the climate vulnerability assessment that is being conducted right now in collaboration um, with the University of Buffalo. Fifth is a link to resources offered by One Region Forward that provides local climate change information, particularly related to planning. And last but not least, I've included a link to Erie County's Climate Action page, where you can also find a variety of locally relevant climate information and also different initiatives and climate action happening at the county level. So with that, I will, I will conclude. I actually wanna leave you um, with one thing that you can do today to sort of make a difference in addressing climate change. Have a conversation about it with someone you live or work with and try to use some of the tips and strategies that I've discussed in this presentation to help you do so more effectively. Ultimately, one conversation at a time is how we're going to turn widespread awareness and concern into meaningful action. I thank you very much for your time. If you have questions, please feel free to email me at the email here on, on the slide, sclark1 at buffalo.edu. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.